Thanks uh, everyone for attending. I'm Tunis. I'm from Docker. Going to yeah talk about uh, image building and uh, build kit. So this build kit. So if you're if you're running uh, like a, a Docker build in in the in the latest versions and you see like hey this is a new output then then yeah this is this is the output that you will see with build kit. So we've completely uh, replaced our old build tooling that we that we had in Docker previously and created a new standalone project. And, and this is one of the first ways how you would see this. So Pilkit, of course, has like many, many new features that are very useful for building. Like if I just pick like some random ones, like uh, build secrets maybe, or uh, or like SSH forwarding, uh, multi-platform support is of course much faster. Uh, but like today, I don't think I have any time to cover almost any of this. So if this uh, is new to you, like, make sure you check out Pilkit later, try it with your own builds and, and stuff like that. But today we have a funding conference. So I think what I discuss instead is uh, some kind of uh, some design decisions that we made when uh, making Pilkit. <laughs> and uh, I think it's important to just start like briefly talking about the history to get some like, a common baseline of, of the prior art and what was there before. So, so uh, Docker, of course, like from, from quite from the beginning has always contained the builder component. Uh, I think it's like a very important uh, component for like uh, boosting all of this uh, image ecosystem that really didn't exist there before Docker. And uh, so, Oh, so like uh, the old, uh, the Docker always had a builder component. It was like embedded in, in the Docker daemon. There's like a, a build endpoint there. It receives a tarball. Uh, it extracts the a tarball, reads the Docker file out of it. And it's actually like quite simple what it does. And like, it's basically like, like parses a command, uh, runs a container from that command, creates an image. And then just takes the next command, so it's very like linear. Just parses through all the all the commands uh, in a very basic case. Uh, then, of course, like some time later, there are some other uh, builders that have appeared as well by some other bigger companies. So usually, what they do is uh, is that they try to replace this run step with something else. So, for example, in case of Conico. They like uh, by definition they already run inside a Docker container, so they don't run the sub containers internally. Instead, they just like run processes in here directly. Uh, otherwise, I think they're quite like similar uh, in the sense that they're like very like self-contained to their use case and uh, and Docker specific. I believe like build I even like or like a build component of build I is some like a fork of some older. Docker, uh, the, like the legacy like Docker file builder. So what's like, uh, how does the build kit differ from this? And uh, when we were planning build kit, of course, like we needed a way to, to write all these features that I just like give you a, a quick glimpse before. And we also like, we know that, uh, that like a project that our users are building at the moment not quite the same like what they were like in 2015 where where like so like container thing was just getting started so we need like more power but we also want to make sure that we're like much more future proof now so i've listed down like four uh, concepts that i think are like important to understand that that uh, that when you when you're comparing those those uh, those builders in those cases so the first thing to start with is that uh, you should understand that BuildKit is not one specific builder. So it's rather like a collection of components that you can combine to make your, your build experience. And of course, like we have embedded BuildKit into the Docker daemon. So if you're on Docker build, you, you get uh, you build actually you can execute the, with the BuildKit stack. Then what we also have is the new BuildX command, Docker BuildX. So this is like the next generation of like Docker branded build features. So it's like a very similar user experience, same flags and things like that, but it 
it has like lots of new commands there for like setting up like multi-node builders and doing namespace setting and, and sharing builders and uh, multi-platform and things like that, building like multi-platform images from one machine. Uh, then another builder to talk about is IMG. So IMG is like a, uh, it's like a rootless and, and daemonless version of Pilkit. So uh, so if you have like allergies against running daemons, then then you can just like take the IMG binary and uh, and drop it into a Linux machine, and you can just do Pilkit builds with without new root there. And I also listed like a bunch of other tools in here. Like all of those define some kind of build interface of their own, but it, in the, in the back end, what gets executed is build it. So, uh, moving on, a uh, second very similar thing to talk about this uh, is different ways to deploy build it. So, important thing in here is that build it indeed can run inside a container, and uh, this is actually like how we do our releases. So, we release official images of build it, like the, the main variant and the rootless variant, whatever you prefer. And uh, well, if you use something like Docker Buildex, then what Buildex can do is they can actually like deploy this Buildkit image for you in like any Docker instance you have access to or like into your Kubernetes cluster. And uh, then you have like your normal build experience, but your builder is contained into, into some kind of sandbox. And uh, of course we have tooling to then connect the Buildkit. And uh, another thing we support is, uh, is that if you're like using ContainerD a lot, then we can just like reuse your container D stack as well. There's like a special worker for container D and then uh, it built it will not create its own snapshots or, or pull its own images or anything like this. It will just reuse container D for everything. It's just like allocates like, like it just becomes like a client for container D. So moving on the another the thing that's, that's very different is that built it Unlike the, the other builders, it's not Docker for specific at all. So there's no like in the build kit solver, there's nothing there that's uh, that's like understands even like Docker file commands or or is like pre-built for for that. Instead, what build kit has is that uh, it has a concept called frontends, and frontends are really like the components that that understand what the build languages are and how you would implement like language support for for uh, for build kit. And so, so they like uh, live between the user and the and the build kit solver itself. So they understand the user's file, and they talk to talk to build kit to actually actually invoke the builds. And uh, to build a front end, you don't need like uh, you need don't need to merge them uh, in tree with uh, with build kit. Uh, uh, you don't need anyone's permission. You don't need to get like a review. You can just build it on your own. Build it as a container image, push it in the registry, and everyone can use it. And like, and you can use it directly from Docker build, and then like every every other uh, tool that uses build it. So they also like run inside the the container, so they're like sandbox, so they can just like run like random stuff in your machine. And of course, like they have some kind of API channel exposed there, where we're actually like talking to build it, so they can do like fancy stuff like call other front ends and and understand the source files and, and things like that. And um, of course, like uh, we are like, we want to make sure that building Docker files is like very easy with with build kits so that, uh, and, and like a best way to build Docker files is with build kits. So we have provided a Docker file front end, but uh, there's other front ends from the community as well. Like you can, you can check those out later. Uh, we just put some of them in here. Like HLB is like, a, let's say, like a more advanced version of Dockerfile. It's developed by uh, some built maintainers from uh, Netflix. Uh, Cockerfile is like a Go-specific thing, so that's what the Go stands for. So it's like, uh, so you don't need like any like specific definition if you're building a Go project. Like it, it's already like fine-tuned for that. Uh, yeah, like uh, for example, the Rust. Thing is quite interesting when it like understands just your like uh, cargo toml file that you have in Rust projects. So it understands that file. It understands your Rust dependencies. It converts them to build kit dependencies. 
and uh, and then uh, uh, like so you get like actual build kit cache when you're doing rebuilds and it like uh, like uh, yeah like uh, how do I explain it it's yeah like for example like if you switch a Rust dependency then it doesn't rebuild uh, all the other dependencies it just like it uses the build kit cache for that it just uh, builds the things that change like you expect it to be and uh, to build it it's like very simple it's like it looks like the old way for building stuff like you can build docker files you can just point it to other definitions and it just works and uh, and of course like we use it also to add new docker file features so doc adding docker file features is something that used to be like super complicated because like whenever we added a feature we that meant that we basically we we break the be we broke the people who used the old docker version and so like you couldn't really like use them unless you were sure that all the all your users were upgraded to the latest docker and that's really not like the experience that we want in Dockerfile at all because like we want Dockerfile to work everywhere without dependencies and stuff like that. So, but now like uh, you can use this build directive that you can find like syntax equals and you can just point it to a to a, an image in, uh, that's that's in the registry, and this is where your Dockerfile definition comes from. So it's the same for every every build kit version. The, uh, so, for example, like in the last Docker version. We added, uh, we made those uh, mount syntaxes for adding secrets and cache mounts uh, like available for everyone by default. But uh, so those things will now work on on the new Docker build. But I still recommend it to add like a line like this in your Docker file as well because then it means that it works on every version of BuildKit, like even the ones that we like shipped like like um, more than a year ago. The those are still able to build it exactly like the. Like Docker file author intended to, because like all the, the Docker file definition, all the definition about the flags and things like that, lives in this image that's pulled uh, during build exactly like your like base image is pulled. So and uh, and fourth thing, what I wanted to mention is something that we picked up from the from the users patterns that we that we saw like how people were using Docker files. Is that they were not even using it to build container images. They were often like just like using them to to build their like any other kind of artifacts as well. And uh, and uh, what you need to do for that is that you often like need to run a special container and then like Docker CP out some files out of it and and do some messy stuff. So so we just like uh, just decided that we can just uh, support this out of the box. So. Uh, like, like in the previous version of of the builder, like I explained briefly before, was that every time we parse the Docker file command, uh, a new image would be created. And so, like you run like a build, and it's like it creates like twenty images after every command. So that's not the case for BuildKit at all. BuildKit does not create any images during build time. Uh, instead, uh, once the build is done, then uh, only after that we take the build result and we send it to a completely different component called exporter and then exporter can then decide that like maybe maybe user wanted to create an image maybe they just want to get some files back to the client maybe they want to push an image maybe they want to get an OCI tarball out of it so it's there's like a, a interface for defining an exporter and and we support like like many exporter types so but it's not look it always uses containers to build stuff but it's not only for building container images So now that like I've explained like how like the like the you can configure your user experience in in BuildKit and uh, and like like how the all the build languages live in separate components or front ends how the exporters are separate you might wonder and like what's the what's the, what's then like left in in BuildKit uh, its own like and what's what's the what's the rest of the BuildKit thing and of course like it's the solver that's the that's the really like the like the core of, of what BuildKit itself is. And as the solver is, uh, is uh, highly concurrent, uh, like uh, uh, graph solver. So it can like do some uh, many more optimizations that like the previous one couldn't. 
and of course, like it very aggressively caches as well. So, so we want to make sure that when you're running multiple or like a repeated build, then if your configuration slightly changes, we don't want to rerun steps that were already run once. And this is really like it's the component that gives this uh, performance boost that you're most likely to see when you're when you uh, when you're using BuildKit. That like it's not like rare at all that we see reports from users that hey, my builds are like two times fast, fast and or even more. So like uh, this solver can, it doesn't just like run all the commands, it can understand what's actually needed. It can understand that that if some parts of your build do not depend on each other, it can build them in parallel uh, and, and, and so on. Like you can understand that like if some things are actually the same as, as some other things. It can combine them together, even if they're like coming from multiple requests and, and things like that. So as I explained to you, uh, the BuildKit itself doesn't like really know anything about Docker files. So that's all in front ends. So what's actually happening is that uh, uh, there's another definition format that's, that's used by the solver. And that's, uh, that's a very like low level definition format. We call it LB. And that's uh, like a binary format uh, that like users really do not see at all, uh, but that's the format that the front ends use. And uh, you can you can uh, like uh, draw the parallel here to the LVM like intermediate representation. So so that's the same concept, or like, at least like a similar concept that you can implement the high level languages in front ends. They compile to LB, and then uh, and then the Bilke solver actually executes the the LB format. And a little bit about the changes in caching as well. So, uh, so that, like the, there is, the caching is completely different from the from the old uh, old caching that was like super weird. It's some like comparison of of uh, image configurations and things like that. So that that's all gone. It's much more well defined now. Uh, we have like definition based caching and also like file checksum based caching. So to work together. Uh, and uh, we have a backend uh, interface for for uh, for building new cache backends. So there's not only like local cache. You can you can uh, have your cache in the registry. You can have your cache in your local blobs or like inline or like we support like fully will add more cache backends in the in the future. So this is how you can, for example, maintain cache when you're doing CI builds and and stuff like that, or or like generate your cache in the CI and then the other users can just use it. So, and uh, so to summarize this, uh, when we combine this all together, what we have is that, um, that we have like a five, five independent areas for development. And I think it's like uh, important because uh, like users requirements are different. Like maybe you have like a, like a specific like constraint for a specific kind of deployment, or maybe you want to use like a specific front end. So, so, uh, so that that allows you to to configure it exactly as you need. But it's also important uh, for the maintainer standpoint because like the maintainer's interests are, are different, and also their like expertise is different, of course. So if I like instead put here some kind of, some options for future development. Then uh, let's say like that that you really need like an ISO exporter so to make like a VM out of your out of your build there for example. So let's say you build this, then of course like all the all the languages that support BuildKit can just like automatically start to use it. Or maybe you know like you're missing this Docker file feature, or maybe like you're probably the one that knows what like the new perfect build language should be. So you can do this all in here like like deal with all the syntax uh, things and and all, all the like the fancy stuff in in the, that the, like a language needs, but you don't need to worry about this area where where all the like a complicated caching happens and and uh, all and all like how to run containers and all and things like that. Or maybe you're from you like this area so that you can uh, maybe you come in and and you modify our solver so that it uh, like understands uh, distributed nodes. And uh, so you can like every build can directly run on on the cluster, uh, and then of course like the whole ecosystem will take advantage of it. 
and uh, I think we're like uh, uh, we're like quite in the beginning of like like the possibilities in here and like or like uh, what this may look like in the future or like uh, what like the like the software building might look like in the future as well. So I, I think I at least I hope that it provides like a, like a good framework for future development and uh, and also like uh, reduces some uh, duplication between like different tools. And so that's pretty much all I had to show for you today. Uh, if you're if, like, like any of this like spark your interest, then make sure to check out the repository. Uh, we also have like a Slack channel in Docker community Slack that you can join to uh, discuss stuff with maintainers, uh, uh, ask questions, things like that. So yeah, to use BuildKit, like the easiest way is like it just uh, it's enabled by default now on on Docker Desktop when you're just doing builds. Uh, in some other versions, like you might still need to set this environment variable to opt in, like whether we can get rid of this, and uh, also make sure to check out Docker build X as well for like extended cool features and and uh, and like uh, and yeah like uh, and some some other like cool tools like how we can do pipelines there and and uh, and name spacing so yeah that's uh, all from me thanks and see if there's any questions Thanks, Tony. Yeah, we have multiple questions. I don't know how many we will get through, but I'll start, um, and then we can take it to the the hallway session after if um, if there are continuing sure. questions. So the first question: Which version of Docker did BuildKit first land? So uh, that's uh, like uh, I, I'd recommend to, when you use BuildKit to use at least like uh, 1903. 1903 is like uh, it's definitely like a, like a stable thing. We had like in, already before that we had something be, behind behind the like experimental flag, but uh, but nineteen oh three is 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 like an is uh, is something that like had like good build kit support already, and uh, and yeah, in the latest version the like uh, we have the we removed all the like experimental flags and things like that. So. Thank you. So, so still, like, of course, I recommend I use the latest version, but but yeah, nineteen oh three is is like compatible in any way as well. Okay. Uh, Misha asks, are Bilkit's builds declarative? Uh, so, not not in the sense that uh, the Bilkit understands your dependencies, so it it doesn't like uh, it doesn't just run all the commands. Uh, it it starts from like the from the build result basically and figure out what the, all the dependencies are to making that result. Well, so so it is it's an actual actual graph builder behind the scenes and like like so like if you have multiple stages for example and just some of the stages are completely unused it will just like skip over them and, and so like so like that. Excellent. Uh, again another question from Nisha is there traceability in the source code of the container and all the transitive dependencies? Uh, I'm not sure what's exactly uh, meant there. Like, is it uh, like uh, like uh, like what what do you mean by source code of the container? Okay, so is that probably something that Nisha can follow up with Jonas on? Maybe, maybe yeah, we can pull up this on Slack. Like, I, I, yeah. I, 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 I don't think he thinks about that. But like, like we have we have like. Uh, uh, so from the tracing standpoint, we have, first of all, we have open tracing support. That's quite interesting that you can see like, like uh, everything that's happening uh, as part of your build. Uh, you also already saw from the progress that we have like, we also like want to show people like a much broader overview of what's actually happening during the build. And uh, from the source tracking, again, like I don't think that's like really the question, but but uh, we we do have like, like support in front ends, for example, that now when you hit the bug in, in a Docker Nisha file. has multiple other questions. And I... So, so. Okay, thanks. So. Nisha has okay. multiple okay. Other, other questions that might need to uh, get a little okay. bit of time uh, on the hallway track. I'm skipping ahead to Dan Valch's question. Does rootless mode require users 
user namespace or do you emulate multiple uids in some other way uh yes it requires user namespace it's uh, it's uh, all uh, like uh, working through the rootless git uh, project for, from from agihira from agihira suda so it's uh, yeah there, there's no like uh, there's uh, there's like a regu regular rootless containers with uh, like the new uid map uh, set you up by the binary that, that does that magic. Yeah. I'm skipping ahead to another question. Will you make it easier to use Bulkit without Docker? It, it works fine next to ContainerD today, but I have to do my own packages and my own systemd services and my own SSH tunneling, etc. Good question. Like, yeah, like we have, like in the repository, we have like the uh, examples of the of the system based services and stuff like that. I, I don't really like personally. I don't really recommend to use Bulky directly. I think you should use like a like a tool that uh, that uh, that wraps it and that that's like more like the user experience around it. Like uh, like one thing that might you might want to look at is is is, the, is Buildex. So with Buildex, you can just use Buildex directly as well. Like you don't like you can just take a Buildex binary and, and you can call it. And you don't really need the whole Docker thing around it. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question: What do what defines what gets exported from the image? The exporter. Uh, so what gets exported from the image? So what gets exported is is your build result. So so like your Docker file defines it. So like in your building a Docker file, for example. Then you're you're pointing it to stage, and the stage is the is the result stage, and this this get, gets exported. So, and and then when you're doing the when you're doing a build, then during the build time you can you can set what kind of like what exporter you want to use. So like the build result is defined by the Docker file, and then it uh, then it uh, goes to to the exporter step. And for example, like if you want to get like a specific file outside of the uh, outside of the image, then what you would do is you would use multi-stage builds and copy this file to this to a separate stage that only contains the binary and and then export that that stage. Excellent. Thanks. Um, I'll ask one more question from Nisha and then um, before we wrap up. Can someone make their own yes, build absolutely. front Everyone end? Everyone can get a, can make a front end. You just need to uh, like uh, yeah, you just build it. You you make it into an image. You you put the image out there in the in the uh, in, in some registry, and then you just refer to this image in here. Like uh, it's uh, it's it lives completely out of the tree. Everyone can make it. And like all all those are 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 uh, are not built in in any way. They're just like community community made. So. Uh, thanks, Jonas, and thanks everyone for attending. Um, I know Minisha has multiple other questions, so if yeah, you want I'll, to I'll hang look at around the chat in then. the hallway, hallway track for a little bit. Thanks. All right, thank you so much.